Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In this lecture, we are going to talk about radioactive decay and how different elements can decay from one into another. So this is how heavy elements can decay into lighter elements. And we also can look at how this can be used to determine ages of things like um, rocks and other materials that we can actually use this to determine ages and how old something is based on that decay. So let's go ahead and start looking at what we mean by radioactive decay and it is the change of an unstable nucleus into another and it is spontaneous it just happens all by itself and in this case we have the parent nucleus what we start with and we have the daughter nucleus in this case uranium 238 for the parent and thorium 234 for the daughter nucleus and then we have what is emitted in this case it is an alpha particle that is emitted by the uranium nucleus and in this case of radioactive decay nothing is needed it just happens it is a spontaneous decay and there is a certain probability that it will occur at any certain time so we will what we find is that as we talked about last time is that this daughter will be more stable than the parent in generally uh, in general however it does not mean that the daughter nucleus is stable it gen just generally lies more closer to the band of stability that we looked at previously so it may be unstable it may not live as long as the parent but in general it is working its way towards that line of stability that we looked at previously so let's go ahead and look at the radioactive decay particles that we can get and what we find is that there are three primary ones which are the alpha particle the beta particle and the gamma rays. So the alpha particle is a helium nucleus which is positively charged. The beta particle is an electron which is negatively charged and gamma rays are electromagnetic waves which have no charge. So these have been detected by having radioactive substances shielded here and it's shielded around lead so that the particles only come out in one direction. And if we go through a couple of electrically charged plates then the beta rays will go in one direction being negatively charged the alpha rays will go in another direction being positively charged and the gamma rays will go straight through because they are not charged at all. So if you also notice the amount of deflection is different that the beta rays are deflected more. Remember that an electron will have a lower mass than an alpha particle. So the deflection will be less based on the mass as well. Now we can look at the different types of radioactive decay that give these and we have the alpha beta and gamma decay as the primary three that we've looked at already in alpha decay an alpha particle or a helium nucleus is emitted. So it emits out two protons and two neutrons as an alpha particle. And this is often happens with very heavy nuclei. So the heaviest nuclei, this is one way to get them down towards that region of stability is by emitting alpha particles. Beta decay it occurs when a neutron is converted into a proton and an electron. The proton remains in the nucleus and the electron or beta particle is then expelled outward. This generally occurs when the neutron to proton ratio is large. So there are too many neutrons in the nucleus. So one neutron will decay into a proton. And remember, again, the whole idea is that it's bringing it toward that band of stability. Gamma emission occurs when the nucleus has been excited. It's in an excited state and it gives off energy. We saw this with uh, electrons and it's a similar sort of thing. In this case, the electron is not excited. It's the entire nucleus. Now we can also get positron emission. If you recall, positron is a piece of antimatter. It is an anti-electron and a positron is emitted from the nucleus. And this occurs when the neutron to proton ratio is small. So in this case, we're making a neutron. We're converting a proton. It gives off a, a positron which contains its positively charged leaving behind a neutral particle which is the neutron.
So again, it, trying to bring it towards that line of stability. And then finally, we can look at electron capture, where an inner electron is actually captured by the nucleus and combines with the proton to form a neutron. So let's go ahead and look at some examples of these in equation form. And what we see is we can talk about alpha decay, where polonium 210 gives off a helium nucleus or an alpha particle to become lead 206. Now remember that everything still needs to balance just as we looked at previously, the atomic masses of 210 has to be the same on the left as the 206 plus four on the right hand side. And as well, we also have to balance the uh, charges which were 84 on the left and now 82 plus 2 giving us 84 on the right. For beta decay we can look at iodine 131 which decays to xenon 131. Now in this case we are giving off an electron with a negative one charge so the mass stays the same at 131. But the charge was 53 and now becomes 54. So 53 is 54 plus a negative one and we have balanced our charges and our masses. For gamma emission we're giving off a gamma ray. So nothing really changes. We have cobalt 60 that becomes cobalt 60. The asterisk is used to indicate that the original cobalt 60 was in an excited state and it gave off that a particle that gamma particle which is a gamma ray. Now that's very similar to a trans admission that we get when we have an electron in an excited state and an excited energy level. If we look at positron emission in this case from oxygen 15 it can give off a positron and become nitrogen 15. Again everything balances 15 uh, mass units on one side and 15 on the other, eight charges on the left and seven plus one is eight charges on the right. And finally, we can look at electron capture, where potassium 40 becomes argon 40. And again, balance everything and make sure that 40 in the, on the left is 40 on the right. 19 plus a negative one on the left becomes 18 on the right. So everything is balanced. And we can also look at these in a tabular form. And let's go ahead and look at that. And what we see is that again, we're looking at the alpha decay, the beta, gamma, positron emission and electron capture. Now the representation shows what happens here. This shows the nuclear equations. But you also want to look at the changes to remind you what happens to the atomic the mass and the atomic numbers. In the case of alpha decay, the atomic mass decreases by four and the atomic number by two. In beta decay, the mass is unchanged. Remember, we're giving off an electron but the atomic number increases by one. Now that's the opposite of what happens in a positron emission where the where it will decrease by one because we are giving off a positive charge. In gamma decay, nothing changes. It is just an excited nuclear state giving off that gamma ray. And electron capture is going to be very similar to a positron emission. In this case, the electron is captured and an X-ray may be given off, but the electron is captured from an inner shell. And then, of course, the mass is unchanged and we will decrease the atomic number by one. Now let's look at a little bit about how these decay and what we call a decay series. So in a radioactive decay series is actually a chain of successive decay. And they can go in various uh, different amounts. We can look at both alpha and beta decay. In this series we are taking uranium 238 and it is decaying to lead 206. But it doesn't just happen in one single step. The uranium just does not decay to that. It has to go in all sorts of steps to do this. And what we find is that the uranium decays to thorium, which uh, through uh, alpha decay and then a couple of beta decays brings it back to uranium, but a different isotope of uranium. This then goes undergoes several different alpha decays in a row to get it down to an isotope of lead, 
but it's not a stable isotope of lead. So we've gotten to lead. Now we have to get it to a stable isotope. And we can see that there's some beta decays and then an alpha and then a couple betas and one more alpha, which leads us at the stable lead 206. So in the end, there will be a stable product at the end of any radioactive decay series. And there's different series for this for uranium, there's the actinide series and the thorium series, depending on exactly what elements you are starting with. So these are several of the examples that you can look at. Now what we want to look at now are the half lives. So the half life of a radioactive element, any radioactive element has a characteristic half life. This is defined as the amount of time it takes for one half of the radioactive material to decay. So we start with 10 grams. In one half life, we've gone down to five grams. Next, we have five grams, we cut that in half. After a second half life, we'll be down to two and a half grams. And so on each half life, we cut the amount remaining by a factor of two. Now, if you look at the text, there are some ways that you can do this using natural logarithms and exponentials that you can use to do exact calculations with half lives. I'm not doing that for this class. So you're welcome to look at that. If you're comfortable with that math, you're welcome to use it. However, it's not what I'm going through in the examples here. I am going to go through other ways that you can do this as well that are a little bit less mathematical for you. So let's go ahead and look at one example using this half life. So our example is going to give us a number of questions. We are going to look at cobalt 60 and we're starting with 20 grams of that. We're given the half life of 5.27 years and we want to know how long it will take that 20 grams to decay into 5 grams. So the first thing we do is we write out what we have here. So we have at time zero when we start, we have 20 grams of the parent, the cobalt 60, and we have none of the daughter. And the ratio of daughter to parent is then nothing. So let's go ahead and let time run forward. And what happens after one half life? So we do one half life would be 5.27 years. The parent cuts in half now to 10 grams and the daughter has gained by the same amount that the parent has lost. So at, after one half life we then have a one to one ratio of the daughter to the parent isotopes. And in that case we actually have exactly the same amount. But we still haven't gotten to five grams yet so we can do this again. Let's go one more half life. After another 5.27 years we will be at 10.54 years here. Now we've got the parent down to five grams. So we've got our answer. And the answer is 10.54 years for the first part of the question. We but to continue, we would now have 15 grams of the daughter. And our ratio would now be three to one 15 to five would reduce to three to one. So we can use this and for the purposes of my class, you can use this as the as your work. You don't need to go through the logarithms. You can simply draw out right out the table and then use that to explain your answers. Now, if we want to do this, continue this, we can find now find out how much would be left if we wait the same amount of time. Well, the same amount of time would be two more half lives. So we'd want to go one two more half lives. And let's go ahead and fill in our table here. And what we'd find is that that would be twice the amount of time as we might expect 21.08 years. But how much would be left at that point? Well, we've gone from five grams. After another half life, we'd go to two and a half. And finally, we'd end up at 1.25 grams after we've waited another two half lives. So our answer to this is the 1.25 grams. Now, finally, we want to look when would the parent to daughter ratio be about five to one? 
Well, at five years, it's one to one. After 10 years, it was three to one. And 15 years, it was seven to one. So we know that it would be somewhere between the 10 and a half between almost 16 years. And you can just approximate in there. Again, you can calculate this exactly if you use the logarithms. But for the purposes of what we need, you can just estimate roughly in between there. That's a little over five years. So you could go about two and a half years from the 10 and a half and find out that it would be about 13 years. Again, you can calculate that exactly. This is sufficient for what we need to do for the course. You can draw out the table and you can answer questions based on that. Now let's look a little bit about how we can use radioactive decay. So and one of the ways is to use it to determine ages of objects. And we can do that here. And one of the common ones is carbon 14 dating. And I'm sure you've heard about that before. What happens is that nitrogen here gains a uh, gets struck and becomes carbon 14. So nitrogen 14, you have a particle come in. Let's convert that to carbon 14. And then we find that there's just a very small trace of that in the atmosphere. And most carbon is in carbon 12. There's a small amount of carbon 13. However, in any living organism, getting this out of the atmosphere would build in some kind of ratio of carbon 14 to carbon 12. And while the organism is living, that will remain roughly the same. It's once the organism dies and the decay begins that the ratio will decrease. And that's what allows us to determine ages, determine how old something is. So here's how we form carbon. We have a nitrogen atom in the atmosphere that gets struck by a neutron and becomes carbon 14 and sends out a proton, a hydrogen nucleus. So it decays with a half-life of 5,730 years. This is very convenient because that's a lot of things that we want to date that are many thousands or tens of thousands of years old. This works out very well. It won't work for determining things that are millions of years old because we have gone through too many half-lives and we'd be down to essentially none of the daughter left. It would be too small of an amount. I'm sorry, none of the parent left that it would be too small of an amount if we tried to think figure things that are millions of years old. And that's why you often hear carbon dating for things like books, things made out of paper from trees that you can use this for. Now, we can do this. Uh, for example, for carbon, it only works certainly for things containing carbon. You can't do carbon dating unless there is carbon there. So you need carbon in it. And that half life, as I said, was way too short to date things like rocks, even if they had carbon in them. There are a couple of other methods that we use to determine the ages of rocks. The uranium to lead that we looked at previously, the half life is four and a half billion years. So that can be used. And we also talked about potassium 40 to argon 40, which has a 1.25 billion year half life. So these can be used to help determine ages of rocks. Let's go ahead and look at one example of those before we finish up here. And what we have is let's go ahead and look at a moon rock that is found to have a ratio of 11 to 1 for argon 40 to potassium 40. And we want to find out how old the rock is. Well, let's go ahead and start off with 100 kilograms of potassium 40. The exact number doesn't matter because it's the ratio that we are going to be looking for. So again, we always start with zero, no half lives, zero years. We have 100 grams of the parent and nothing of the daughter. Now we can let it decay one half life. And now we're 1.25 billion years later, giga years as giga for a billion. We now have a one to one ratio, 50 grams of each because the parent half of the parent has decayed and half of it has as has become the daughter half of it has remained and we can continue that process 
Let's look at one more. Again, half of the parent has decayed. So we've gone down from 50 to 25. That extra 25 now adds to the daughter giving it 75 grams. And we now have a ratio of three to one, three times the amount of the daughter as of the parent. Now we're looking for 11 to one. So we're going to have to continue this process and just work down the table. Let's fill that in. And we see that after three half lives will be to seven to one, four will be 15 to one, five will be 31 to one. And we're looking for again something in between three and four half lives. So we're looking for something in this range between the 3.75 and the five billion years. So we could estimate 11 to 1 is roughly halfway in between there and we may be looking at something around perhaps 4.3 billion years. And that's actually a reasonable amount because some very old moon rocks would be 4.3 billion years old, some of the oldest ones that we have found. So we can use this as a way of determining ages, how old rock samples are here on Earth or even out in space, such as moon rocks. So let's go ahead and finish up with our summary. And what we've looked at this time is we talked about what radioactive nuclei are. They spontaneously decay into other nuclei. This happens without any uh, any other action. They automatically do this. We looked at the five different types of radioactive decay, alpha, beta, gamma, electron capture, and positron emission. And then we also looked at the half-lives. And these radioactive materials have half-lives that we can use to determine ages of objects. So that concludes this lecture on radioactive decay. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day everyone, and I will see you in class.